following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. I'm thinking my life is over. Cancer with no cure. You're going to be dead probably within six months. And it only went downhill from there. She may not survive the treatment itself. One patient is given a choice. You can die and come home and be with me, or you can choose life and live. And a miraculous healing. I remember the zap of energy going through my body. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Already far worse than expected, a stunning 9.9 .9 million Americans filed for unemployment in just two weeks, and many millions more may be out of work. Economists warn the coronavirus pandemic could lead the country into a severe recession. Some good news, relief for small businesses who take advantage of the Paycheck Protection Plan. What else is in the works to ease the economic impact? Jennifer Wishon explains. We're now beginning to feel the full effects of the pandemic, along with the economic stress of the lockdown measures needed to prevent it from spreading. This is going to get worse before it gets better. Jobless claims are already far worse than expected. Nearly 10 million Americans filed for unemployment in just two weeks. And those numbers may be low because states are overwhelmed with all of the new claims. So there may actually be many more people out of work. Everything is now still marked pending. So I know everybody probably is experiencing the exact same frustrations. And this is likely just the tip of the iceberg. Economists, Wall Street firms, and some Fed leaders expect unemployment to reach anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, along with a potentially severe recession. But help is on the way. As part of the $2.2 trillion stimulus bill, starting today, small businesses, which employ nearly half of the nation's workforce, can take advantage of the Paycheck Protection Act, nearly $350 billion in loans. You get the money, you'll get it the same day. You use this to pay your workers. Please bring your workers back to work. If you've let them go, you have eight weeks plus overhead. These loans are up to 100% forgivable as long as employers keep paying their workers. Lawmakers are now pushing for another $2 trillion relief bill, this time possibly focusing on an infrastructure package designed to put people back to work while upgrading the nation's road, broadband and water systems. But with the ink barely dry on the last $2 trillion deal, reaching agreement on another one so soon will be tough because of sharp differences between Democrats and Republicans. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Well, it may not be enough. Uh, right now, we're looking at a shutdown in the credit markets. Uh, will the Small Business Administration uh, be able to ramp up fast enough in order to cover uh, how many applications there will be for these loans? And what are the qualifications? What, what's even the paperwork necessary to get it? And if you're a small business, do you carry payroll while you're waiting for the Small Business Administration to process your application. Uh, these are going to be very crucial questions that literally need to get answered in 24 hours, 48 hours. I mean, the, the, that, it's that kind of time frame. Uh, then you add into it 9.9 .9 million people over the last two weeks applying for unemployment. Are the states going to be absolutely overwhelmed? This is unprecedented in history. Do they have enough staff to handle that volume of uh, unemployment claims? Uh, these are all very serious days, very serious days economically uh, for our country. And you start getting into what's called a cascading crisis, where if credit markets um, dry up and you can't go to the bank and get a loan, if the Small Biz Business Administration can't properly process that, how quickly can the federal government get the checks for $1,200 to the average family? How quickly can the unemployment insurance benefits start coming in? Uh, then if that doesn't happen quickly, then you're going to start having people not be able to pay their mortgages, not be able to pay their rent, small businesses not be able to pay their loans. And then are you going to have stress tests on the banks? Uh, they're, there are cascading events from this that are very concerning. 
In other news, as the coronavirus mitigation measures now stretch through April, some officials are cracking down harder to enforce restrictions. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN Newsroom. Gordon, government actions have led to questions of whether this crackdown could endanger America's religious freedom. Paul Strand brings us the story. The most recent incident involves the arrest of well-known megachurch pastor Rodney Howard Brown for holding a service at his Tampa church. Liberty Council's top lawyer is representing Brown and says the pastor's church went way out of its way to make the service safe. At this church, required a six foot distance, required sanitizing, required the wearing of gloves, and also purchased over $100,000 of special high grade air purification systems. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio has threatened to permanently shut down churches or synagogues that continue to hold services. And President Trump is warning congregations against congregating. Well, my biggest disappointment is that churches can't meet in a time of need. And yet, if you do that, if you do it close, you're really giving this invisible enemy a very big advantage. Religious rights reporter Todd Starnes told CBN Newswatch about a frightening police presence outside an Illinois church. The local sheriff's department showed up and they were actually counting cars in the parking lot and they were photographing license plates of people. Uh, we had a report from Louisiana where they were told that if they did not shut down their services, the National Guard would be come in. Staver says authorities need to guard religious liberty as well as people's health. This is a major constitutional issue that we have to balance with a scalpel, not a chainsaw when it comes to protecting public health and safety. There's a way to do both without sacrificing either. Constitutional attorney John Whitehead is appalled at hearing reports of authorities grabbing guns and arresting people just for walking around outside. That undermines everything the founding fathers gave us, and which was our liberties. And what it means is you don't have absolute rights if the government can just take them away. But the Heritage Foundation's Cully Stimson says governors are well within their constitutional rights if it involves going after people whose behavior could threaten the public's health. And I think it's those people that the governors are rightfully targeting and the police will rightfully uh, warn and then sternly warn and then give a fine to and if ultimately necessary, uh, jail. The Southern Baptist Convention's Russell Moore defends the authorities, writing, Nowhere at this point have we seen churches targeted because of their beliefs or mission. In fact, he points out this is an area, the protection of public health, where the state has not just a legal authority, but an authority granted by God himself. Moore concludes, Concern for public health is not a violation of religious liberty. Other states, though, are deciding not to use the force of law on churches, like Ohio. Well, I didn't think it was proper really for government to uh, infringe upon people's First Amendment rights. Instead, Governor DeWine has only advised religious leaders. Say, look, you know, you're not doing your folks any, any favors by bringing them together. Church members certainly aren't exempt from COVID-19. Early last month, an Arkansas church held a children's program, and afterwards, three visitors and 31 church members tested positive for the virus. The church's pastor among them. He later wrote the congregation, the intensity of this virus has been underestimated by so many, and I continue to ask that each of you take it very seriously. Tomorrow, As for Pastor Rodney Howard Friday, Brown, he announced on Twitter, all river members, if you can get the word out and just say no church on Sunday, to, pastor said he is protecting his flock, not from the virus, but from tyrannical government. Please. Paul Strand, CBN News. The coronavirus outbreak means churches around the world are not able to celebrate Easter as usual this year. So Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in California and his wife Kay are hosting an international online prayer gathering on Monday. They'll be joined by respected church leaders from around the world. Warren says regardless of these unprecedented circumstances, the message of Easter remains the same. Jesus is the hope of the world. Together we'll pray for our churches, our communities, and the world as we unite as the body of Christ to proclaim the hope of the resurrection at Easter. The 90-minute event will be held at 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Monday. CBN is making it available across all of our apps and streaming platforms, including YouTube and Facebook. You can also watch it on the CBN News Channel. The coronavirus outbreak is shutting down famous locations all around the world, including Israel. The virus has closed a number of sites in the Jewish state that people travel from around the world to see, among them, the old city of Jerusalem. Chris Mitchell brings us that story. 
This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre from a few years ago. Tourists and Christian pilgrims coming to see where many believe Jesus Christ was crucified and rose from the dead. This is what the courtyard of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre looks like now, empty. And for the first time in years, Christian pilgrims from around the world won't be coming here to celebrate Easter. This is heartbreaking, not having to be able uh, to visit inside, uh, just to come here and to see the doors closed. Israel will allow the church to live stream its global Easter service with a limited staff of no more than 10. Just a 10 minute walk away. Here at the Western Wall, this area is usually filled with people praying, but now because of the coronavirus, only a limited number of men can come to pray and they have to be separated by at least six feet. We're here before the Creator of the world, especially in this hour, asking Him that He will open the gates of heaven to our prayers and send healing to all the sick in the world. In a rare act, just before Passover, they're blowing the shofar. It's written in the Torah that in the hour of war, blowing the shofars that the Holy One, blessed is He, will hear our prayers. Another casualty of COVID-19 here in Jerusalem's old city are its alleys and shops, once filled with tourists and shoppers, now shuttered and empty. This whole situation affected us a big time. We've been, our shops has been closed for the last 14 days. COVID-19 hit the old city just before Holy Week, the busiest time of the year. Usually this place would be packed. You cannot even put your feet. Unlike many other shopkeepers in the old city, Zach has a plan B, an online business called ZachsJerusalemGifts.com. Some gifts like anointing oil and prayers, you know, from Jerusalem, because everybody wants Jerusalem and wants to touch from Jerusalem, especially these days. Despite the devastating impact on the old city, many here say the message from Jerusalem to the world remains the same. From Jerusalem, if you come, his tomb is empty, he was resurrected, and this is our encouragement. Things will be fine. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem's old city. And that's the message for all of us. The tomb is empty. Even if we can't celebrate Easter together, we can still celebrate the resurrection. He is alive. He is risen and he is risen indeed. Well, while coronavirus rages around the world and you're home on lockdown, you may be asking, how can I get through this? Nearly 400 years ago, a French soldier asked that question while being held captive as a prisoner of war. That soldier escaped and later became a monk known as Brother Lawrence. He made it his life's mission to practice the presence of God. Here's some of his advice on how to get through difficult times. Courage. God often allows us to go through difficulties to purify our souls and to teach us to rely on Him more. So offer Him your problems unceasingly and ask Him for the strength to overcome them. Talk to Him often. Forget Him as seldom as possible. Praise Him. When the difficulties are at their worst, go to Him humbly and lovingly. As a child goes to a loving father and ask for the help you need from his grace. We have a God who is infinitely good and who knows what he is doing. He will come and deliver you from your present trouble in his perfect time and when you may least expect it. Hope in him more than ever. Thank him for the strength and patience he is giving you, even in the midst of this trial, for it's an evident mark of his concern for you. Encourage yourself with his love and thank him for everything. If we knew how much he loves us, we would always be ready to face life, both its pleasures and its troubles. The difficulties of life do not have to be unbearable. It's the way we look at them, through faith or unbelief, that makes them so. We must be convinced that our Father is full of love for us and that He only permits trials to come our way for our own good. I don't know what God has in store for me, but I feel so serene that it doesn't matter. What do I have to be afraid of when I'm with Him? 
That's a question for all of us. What do we have to be afraid of when we're with God? When we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, we have everything we need. He has provided eternity for us, and he will provide our every need now. All we have to do is turn to him. So let's do that right now. And if you're feeling anxious, if you're worried, uh, if you're wondering what's the future, realize Jesus already has your future. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega. He is the author. He is the finisher. Let's turn to him because he will do a very good job. Let's pray. Lord, we lift everyone in the audience to you right now. And as the whole world shelters in place, let us turn our hearts to you. For without you, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. So Lord God Almighty, we ask for wisdom in these days. We ask for the creative ideas that you, our creator, can give. Show us what to do. Show us how to get through this. But most of all, Lord God, unite us together in love. Let us realize we're all in this together, even though we're separated, even though we're isolated. We're still in you, and we're still in this together. So make us one people. Let your great prayer that we would be one just as you and the Father are one. Let your great prayer come to pass today. And give us your peace, your security now. Quiet us, Lord God. Quiet our hearts, our spirits. Quiet us with your peace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you need prayer, it's our honor, our privilege to pray with you. Our, our prayer center has now gone remote, and we have lots of people ready, willing, and able to pray with you at any time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're here for you. So if you need prayer, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, a wife and mother of four is diagnosed with aggressive bone cancer. Why does she decide to stop treatment after a supernatural visit? Her story is coming up later. And then up next, a tale of two cities. One is shutting down its last abortion clinics. Its neighbor just opened its doors to Planned Parenthood. Could this be a peek at America's future? States across the country are taking a variety of positions on abortion, and some are diametrically opposed. As Heather Sells reports, the tension is especially high in St. Louis, Missouri, which sits just across the Mississippi River from Illinois. There's not just a river dividing Missouri and Illinois. There is a world of difference when it comes to abortion. Missouri is on its way to becoming the first abortion-free state in the country, and Illinois is moving towards becoming the abortion capital of the Midwest. Our hope is that Missouri would ultimately become the very first abortion-free state. I think we are well, well on our way. They're getting all the restrictions off the books so that it is as easy as possible to get women access to abortion, and that includes taxpayer funding of abortion, which we have here in Illinois. Brian Westbrook and Mary-Kate Knorr both lead anti-abortion work and face completely different challenges. In Missouri, pro-lifers believe the state may soon shut down its last remaining abortion facility in St. Louis. The state health department wants to revoke its license, citing four, quote, failed abortions. Westbrook says there's been 70 ambulance calls in the last 10 years. What's happened over and over and over again is that women are leaving this abortion facility on a stretcher. Over the years, the Missouri pro-life movement has steadily grown. Today, it boasts a pro-life legislature and governor, 70 pregnancy centers around the state that care for women in crisis, and strategic thinking that's led to innovation. Two years ago, the Archdiocese of St. Louis 
opened a convent right next door to the state's last abortion facility. The sisters can literally watch the women coming and going from their kitchen window. Their mission is to pray for them. We're praying for an end to abortion. We're praying for the women that go in there and come out. They're also praying for the sidewalk counselors who greet Planned Parenthood clients and employees whenever the facility is open. The counselors use a new approach, which has become known as the St. Louis Method. The St. Louis Method is focused on her, on the woman in that car. A little bit on the driver, but sometimes she's not the driver. And so it's about forming that relationship right away and it's about what I can offer her. This offering of resources like free pregnancy tests and ultrasounds literally turns the cars around and persuades one in 100 women to go elsewhere for help. In the last nine years, more than 2,500 cars have turned around. Just across the Mississippi in Illinois, it's like night and day. Mary Kate Knorr faces a political climate that has stripped most abortion restrictions and this year hopes to wipe out parental notification. This law is considered a checkpoint in the event that girls as young as 10 years old are being trafficked and brought into abortion clinics to continue that cycle of trafficking um, by putting a stop to their pregnancy. Nor and other pro-lifers see the abortion industry positioning Illinois and other liberal states for a post-Roe world. The thinking, if the Supreme Court reverses Roe v. Wade, Abortion-friendly states will serve as regional hubs and hope to attract pregnant women in abortion-free states. For now, those states have become industry money makers. Their strategy is they're going to leverage Illinois, New York, Virginia, amongst other states across the country to make up for where they're losing their bottom line in states like Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, etc. The latest example, a Planned Parenthood facility in Fairview Heights, Illinois, just across the river from St. Louis. It opened last October after months of secret renovations on a local property. The news surprised and shocked many government and business leaders in town who came out to protest the new facility. We just knew it was a medical facility. They had done everything right, but they kept it very undercover. Planned Parenthood has announced that it can see up to 11,000 women a year here. The news has rallied Bergdorf and other like-minded citizens. They're quickly creating a variety of services for pregnant women and teaming up with their St. Louis allies who have brought their sidewalk counseling to Fairview Heights. We went into some pretty deep prayer, spent a lot of time reflecting and uh, realized that it, this is our neighborhood. You know, Illinois, Missouri, uh, St. Louis is a broad region that uh, crosses the river. Uh, and most of the women who are getting abortions in the Fairview Heights, Illinois location are Missouri women. And so if they can travel another 30 minutes east of here, we can drive that as well. Driving across the state line for an abortion and to stop those abortions is new territory here but it could become the new reality across the country if the nine justices in Washington decide what pro-lifers hope they will on Roe v. Wade. Reporting in St. Louis, Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, I think this is where we're going as a nation. We're going to have a patchwork of state laws on abortion. Uh, New York and Illinois have already set up to the day of birth, which is just un literally unbelievable to me. Uh, so th there'll, there'll be this um, shopping, if you will, that, you know, at, at which state is it going to be legal? And uh, you're going to have the construction, just as we're seeing right now in Illinois, the construction of these um, mega centers uh, to provide abortions for women from other states. Uh, is that a country we want? Uh, no, uh, but in, in the absence of uh, sort of a universal law on this, uh, that's what we're going to see. And that's been the prediction since Roe versus Wade. If Roe goes away, then it all goes back to the states and what states decide is legal or illegal. Uh, and that's the world that will probably happen. I, I think Roe versus Wade uh, will 
fairly soon be overturned. It was bad constitutional law to begin with. Uh, and this all should have happened through legislation and not through some dictate from the Supreme Court finding penumbras of privacy within the Constitution. So that's, that's where it's going. And uh, the good news is that finally the power is back where it needs to be with the people of the United States. Uh, we get to decide what is legal and what is illegal. And it's not up to nine justices uh, dictating from on high and trying to change the society and change the social fabric. So from that standpoint, uh, that's good for democracy and it's good for the nation. Terry? Well, up next, a husband and father gets laid off and the financial pressure is on. How will he and his family manage? Stay tuned to find out. When Travis Van Dorn was laid off, he and his wife, Kara, could have panicked. Instead, they relied on God's promise to provide for their family. And that's exactly what happened. Travis and Kara cherish spending time with their two young daughters. But just a few years ago, family time was rare. Travis was working long hours away from home as a plant manager. I saw my kids usually four days every two weeks. After 12 years with the same company, Travis expected a promotion. But in 2016, just before Thanksgiving, he was laid off. Kara was a stay-at-home mom, so it was a blow to their family's income, but not to their faith. God provides. It's not the job. It's not the things that we do, but He will take care of all of our needs. And living that out is really hard sometimes. Travis and Kara prayed strategically about their needs. As homeschoolers with two young children, they felt the pressure but they never stopped tithing or giving to CBN. Less than two months later, Travis was offered a new job making more money. Plus, he wasn't traveling as much. So I see my, <laughs> my kids twice as much as what I used to, so. And to see that worked out, it strengthened our relationship and our marriage as well. Travis and Kara were so grateful they decided to increase their giving to CBN. For them, it's all about faith and trust. CBN honors the money that you give, and it's at work in the lives of other people. And that's one of the reasons that I'm most excited about CBN. There's a heart for Christ, a heart for shining God's love out into the world, and for caring for people. And that's really the mission, the Great Commission. And um, so that's why we love CBN. I think CBN ends up touching many of the areas of the world that you as an individual cannot touch. God will return much more than what you've given because whatever you've released to Him, He will return to you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Now that wonderful family trusted in God. Here they were laid off. What do we do? Well, we're going to trust God and we're going to live life God's way. When you do that, then you find that He directs your paths. He will watch over you. He will protect you. He will provide for you. All He's waiting for you to do is to show your faith and to show that you trust Him and you believe Him. You're not going to look at your own understanding. You're not going to look at the circumstances. But you say, God, you've got a way here. And even though there are wind and waves and things are very tumultuous right now, you have a way that I can actually walk on water. When you have that kind of faith, He will provide for you and you can have financial breakthroughs even in the middle of economic turmoil. All you have to do is trust Him with all of your heart. Now, if you want to do that with your finances, you know, where, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. If you want to uh, give a gift so that we can continue broadcasting the good news during this worldwide pandemic, I invite you now, join the 700 Club. How much is it? Well, it's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold, 
that's forty dollars a month. Thousand Club is a thousand dollars a year. That's eighty-four dollars a month at whatever level. Call us now and say yes, I want to join. One eight hundred seven hundred seven thousand. Now, when you call, I've got something for you. It's my father's book, Ten Laws for Success: Keys to Win in Work, Family, and Finance. Uh, it'll be sent right to you when, when you join at a, for a pledge of $20 or more a month. You can text us, text CBN to 71777. And then we have a special bonus for you, um, some excerpts from my father's upcoming book, uh, two chapters, a preview v bonus of I Have Walked with a Living God. It's all yours when you join, so call us now, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, a rare bone cancer with a treatment so harsh it left this woman comatose. Her chances without treatment, zero. So what happened to her in a hospital bed that led to a miracle? Plus, we'll be praying for you and your needs, and all of that is coming up. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. The Navy has relieved the captain of the USS Theodore Roosevelt. Earlier this week, Captain Brett Crozier wrote a memo to Navy leaders to allow him to evacuate personnel from the aircraft carrier docked in Guam after dozens of sailors contracted the coronavirus. The Secretary of the Navy said the captain demonstrated extremely poor judgment. He said the captain copied too many people on his memo and it was leaked to a California newspaper and spread to many news outlets. The Navy is evacuating more than 3,000 crew members from the ship. The coronavirus has already hit the U.S. hard. Everything from food banks running out of food to emergency responders who can't get cleaning supplies to hospitals running out of masks. But CBN's Operation Blessing has stepped in, providing an increased amount of goods to food banks that partner with Operation Blessing and giving critical supplies, buckets filled with cleaning supplies to firefighters and other emergency responders across the Hampton Roads area here in Virginia, along with thousands of N95 masks to area hospitals. Thanks to its partners, Operation Blessing is providing hope across the country during these difficult times. And you can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Well, if you're sheltered in place and want something that the whole family can watch, this is the real story of St. Patrick. St. Patrick in his own words. The script is taken from his confession, uh, which he wrote back in the 5th century, and it details his life. Growing up in Britain, growing up in a life of relative privilege, and then being captured, taken away, sold into slavery in Ireland, and then God speaks to him, redeems him, shows him a way out of slavery. He becomes a priest, then he becomes a bishop, and then God calls him back to preach the gospel to the very people who had enslaved him. It's an incredible story, an incredible story that God still speaks today, God still calls, God still sends. I hope it will inspire you and your family. It's yours for a gift of $15 or more. We'll send you the DVD, and then you can watch it right now, streaming through the CBN Family app or on CBN.com. Uh, call us now if you'd like it, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Marjorie Heitkamp had a devastating form of bone cancer, so rare and aggressive that there is no cure. She was suffering in the hospital when she got a visitor, and right after he spoke to her, Marjorie was miraculously healed. As a mother of four, 38-year-old Marjorie Heitkamp had little time to be sick. But in September of 2012, when a persistent cough wouldn't clear up, she decided to see a doctor. They found a spot on what they thought was my lung. I was a former smoker years ago, um, and I thought it caught up to me. And they referred me to um, get a biopsy done. Then I was afraid. The biopsy came back positive. Marjorie would need surgery. They told me they were going to remove the upper and the middle lobe of my right lung. I was very nervous because, you know, anytime you're going into your chest, it's a very major, major surgery. Marjorie and her husband, John, 
prayed that the surgery would get all the cancer. I was afraid of losing my wife and the children uh, potentially losing their mother. My prayer was, Lord, let them get it all in Jesus' name. I do not have time for chemo. I do not want to go through losing my hair or anything, being really sick. I have a family to care for. It wouldn't be that simple. During surgery, doctors discovered the mass wasn't in her lung, but on one of her ribs. They removed the rib and sent it for testing. Then they waited. It was very hard to see her in terrible pain. It's a very scary time. I'm glad that I had a great support system through my church. Finally, the results were in. There's a counselor in the room with a box of tissue. I lose it and I start crying and I'm thinking, this must be serious. The oncologist says, this is mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. Bone cancer. So rare and aggressive, there is no treatment protocol. Her oncologist's best guess was high doses of radiation, followed by intense chemo. I wish I could say that I had peace, but with a, a diagnosis like this, it shook me to my core. Even though I'm praying and I'm, I believe in the power of prayer and I believe in healing, and I, I just thought to myself, this is really bad. I'm thinking my life is over. Just before Christmas, Marjorie started a daily radiation regimen that left her growing weaker every day. I didn't even want to tell my husband some of the things that I was going through because I didn't want him to worry because I already knew he was worried. He was terrified of um, having to raise the kids by himself and being by himself. I was angry at God that this was happening. I, I yelled at him. I was so mad and hurt with him. We've been faithful servants to you, God. How could you let this come up on my wife? It would get worse. After finishing radiation, Marjorie, weak and drained, was admitted to the hospital and started aggressive chemotherapy. I was listening to the word. I was doing everything I could to try to stay encouraged. I made a choice. I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight the fight of faith. It was the most difficult thing that I've ever had to go through. The window of treatment was so small. After one round of chemo, Marjorie had a bad reaction that rendered her unconscious and nearly comatose. The doctor said that just because of the extreme nature of the chemotherapy and the experimental treatment that they were using, that it was possible that she may not survive the treatment itself. While John and the doctors considered options, Marjorie says she had a visit from God. He said, you can die and come home and be with me, or you can choose life and live. I didn't want to leave my husband and my kids, and I said, God, I want to live. I remember just at that time, this zap of energy going through my body, like a electricity. Um, and I remember setting up in bed and I said, I'm healed. Against the doctor's advice, Marjorie and John decided to stop treatment. My oncologist came into the room. He goes, you will die if you don't have chemo. There's 0% survival with this cancer with no chemo. If you don't finish this, you're gonna be dead probably within six months. Holding on to their faith and God's promise, the couple went home. Three months later, Marjorie went for her first cancer checkup. First one came up negative, and I told the doctor, see, I told you, I told you I'm cancer free. I'm healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I went through every three months of going to getting CT scans with contrast, and um, every test was negative after that. Um, the last test I had was December of 2018 and it's still negative, still cancer-free. <laughs> Today, Marjorie loves to share about the power of prayer and a God who heals. Every morning you get up, thank Him for another day. Thank Him and praise Him. Praise Him in all times. No matter how sick you feel, you praise Him. And you need to proclaim His word over you and speak out healing. They told me I wasn't supposed to be here. Do not listen to that. You listen to the Word of God. 
by his stripes you are healed. Amen and amen. That was the price that was paid for you 2,000 years ago. What happened to Marjorie can happen for you. Christ paid this because he conquered death. And so that is extended to us as his children. It's a part of our inheritance to stand in the grace of his healing. Today, we want to take an opportunity to pray with you. You know, for some of you, it may not be physical. For some of you, you may have other things that you're contending with in your life. Maybe addictions to something. Maybe you've got financial issues that are just eating you up. God wants to set you free from that. Jesus said he came so that we could live life abundantly. So today we want to pray together with you. We want to all link arms, link hearts, and petition the maker of heaven and earth for the thing that's heavy on your heart and in your life. Uh, I have another answer to prayer here. This is Christine. Three weeks ago, she says she got a kidney stone. It was the first time she had an ultrasound. And the next day, her doctor's office called a lesion measuring 1.5 centimeters was seen on my right kidney. Absolute fear roared through me. I needed a CT scan with contrast. The night before my appointment at three in the morning, I'm watching the 700 Club and Gordon is praying. There's someone watching who's been told there's something wrong with your right kidney, an infection cancer, cancer symptoms, symptoms. God is healing you of that. You'll feel something go through you. Get retested. You're healthy. I claimed it as I had been holding my hand on my right kidney since the program started. I felt a zing, nothing painful, just a buzz in my kidney. I had the CT scan. The next day, my doctor's nurse called me with relief and joy. She left a message that it was gone. I'm a walking miracle, the richest woman in the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah indeed. Uh, praise God. Well, here's Joe. I was riding my stationary bike at home while watching the 700 Club. Terry said, there's someone with severe pain in their neck that extends down into the shoulder. You will pull your hand on your, if you will put your hand on your neck, God is going to heal you. Well, I accepted Terry's prayer was for me. I heard a loud pop in my neck and God instantly healed me. At that very moment, I could turn my head without pain and I had no pain in my shoulder. I put my hands in the air and started praising God and thanking him over and over. I had pain in my neck and shoulder for years, instantly healed, cancers gone, lesions on kidneys gone, pain is just gone. Why? Because God loves you. He loves you. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in him right now with all of your heart. Realize you can't figure your way out but he has a way and he will direct your path into that way. So we're going to pray. All we want is for you to agree. And the Bible says, if two or more agree, touching anything, it shall be done. So Terry and I are going to agree and we're going to agree with you and you are going to agree and you're going to touch. So in an act of faith, touch that area of the body that needs healing. If it's throughout your body, touch the top of your head. If you can't reach it, well, just have someone pray with you, standing with you, have them lay hands on it. If you, can't, if you don't have anybody like that, just lay your hand on your heart. Let's believe God. That's the key. Let's believe in the one he sent. Let's believe in his sacrifice. And let's pray. Jesus. We come to you and we come to your cross and to your sacrifice and by your stripes we are healed. By your blood we are cleansed from all iniquity and you heal all our diseases. So right now stretch forth your hand to do miracles, to heal joints and limbs, to take away cancer, to take away this horrible virus. In Jesus' name, as people are laying hands on that area of the body that needs healing, in Jesus' name, touch and heal now and be every bit whole. 
There's someone, your name is Mary, and you're laying your left hand on your right shoulder, and God has just done a tremendous miracle for you. What you couldn't do before, move that right shoulder, that right arm, and realize you have been completely healed. Mm -hmm. There's someone else, you have bone on bone pain in your left knee, uh, and in the middle of this virus, you just don't know what to do. You don't even want to go to the doctor, but Jesus has come to you. He's come right to that joint right now. In the name of Jesus, be healed, all pain be gone, be restored and move normally in Jesus' name. Tara? Yeah, there's someone, you're a stroke victim and you have partial paralysis. You're, it's just been such a slow slog through the mud to get any, any of what you've lost back. But today you're gonna to begin to feel that side of your body that's paralyzed come back into use. There's gonna be just a tingling as your nerves come back into play and God touches you and you begin to have use of what you've not been able to use for, use for a while. Just lift up your hands and begin to praise the Lord. Use what you could not use before. Um, there's someone you're not even praying, um, but you have an unusual condition where there's calcium that's being built up on, on the brow uh, above both your eyes. And it's just, it, it's like you're getting a protruding brow from this. Mm -hmm. Not even asking for healing, but God is coming to you right now He's able to restore. He's able to do miracles for you. And so he's just named your condition to give you the faith to believe it's all going to be normal. It's all going to be okay. Yeah. Someone else, you have had, you've contracted some kind of a lung condition from fertilizer and things that you've been using in your yard and your property. Um, you're so fearful with this COVID 19 situation. God's healing your lungs for you right now. Just begin to take a deep breath in. You'll be able to breathe like you haven't been able to. No coughing anymore after that. You're not compromised. Your lungs are healed in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you have done, all you are doing, and all you're about to do. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. It's our honor, our privilege to pray with you. Now we've got some time for some email questions. We do. This first one, Gordon, comes from Jane, who says in the verse, many are called, few are chosen. If someone is called but not chosen, does that mean that he or she cannot receive salvation? Also, could you explain what being called means? Well, it all comes from the Gospel of Matthew. So let's get into what the Bible says about it. It's Matthew chapter 22. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways, gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, find him, hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So what Jesus is saying here is that uh, don't try to get into heaven on your own righteousness. Don't wear your own garment and think that you're going to come into the wedding feast. You have to choose to surrender to him, not rely on your own righteousness at all. Rely on the righteousness that is freely given to you by the Son of God. We have his righteousness, his peace, and his joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what this verse means. All are called. The message of salvation is for everyone. Uh, and the difference is those who receive it. And if you're trying to make it on your own merit, stop. Stop. Change your filthy garment and get into the garment that Jesus so freely gives. Gordon, this is Diana who says, do I have to speak in tongues when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? And if I don't speak in tongues, does it mean I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, there's a lot of confusion on this. And then some take it as a doctrinal evidence that if you speak in tongues, you're, you're filled. If you don't, uh, then you're not filled. And I think this actually disagrees with scripture. Here's what 1 Corinthians says. 
Are all apostles? Uh, answer is obviously no. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gift, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. The number one evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit, your love. So let your love be shed abroad. Here's a scripture from Isaiah. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. God bless you. We'll see you again.